Hello, friends, and welcome to Catholicism Live. My name is Angela Cialana, and I'm so glad to be back here with you this evening. Uh, we have a very special topic to discuss, and I'm so excited for you to meet our guests. Um, but I do want to welcome you again to Catholicism Live, which is a weekly program uh, produced by the Pilgrim Center of Hope, along with uh, Catholic Television of San Antonio. As well, we are simulcast uh, through the Guadalupe Radio Network live. So if you're tuning in through GRN, uh, give them a little thanks and tell them you like to hear uh, Catholicism live on uh, Catholic Radio. You can also listen to us on our website, catholicismlive.com. And by the way, the website is updated, so we have a great feedback form for you to give us your feedback, your questions. What do you want to hear about on Catholicism Live? We talk about topics of the faith and relate them to everyday life. So um, usually we have our wonderful hosts, Deacon Tom Fox and his wonderful wife, Mary Jane, but they are in the Holy Land, uh, their second home, as we like to say, uh, and they're leading two groups of pilgrims this month through the Holy Land. So we're really happy that they're um, enjoying that time. They love being at the Holy Land and they are taking your prayer intentions to the Holy Sites. Um, so I'm here with you and I'm very happy to be here. Uh, we have a wonderful topic this evening. We're talking about church buildings. Now, have you ever asked yourself why does the Catholic Church have so many fancy churches? Or why are our churches so much more ornate or have more, um, more pieces involved, more elements involved? If you've ever been to, say, a Protestant um, place of worship, an evangelical church, you'll definitely notice the difference. Um, there are a lot of differences. So we're going to talk about why that is and how Catholic churches actually teach us some spiritual realities. We're going to look at the history of churches. Um, and we're here actually with two Catholic architects who are married. Now, how often does that happen? <laughs> Our guests tonight are Pam and Scott Carpenter. They are uh, with Seventh Generation Design here in San Antonio and also have been Holy Land Pilgrims with the Pilgrim Center of Hope. Yes. So uh, welcome to Catholicism Live. Thank you, Angela. Appreciate it. Thank you, Angela. We're happy to be here. And I'm so happy to have you. So we have so much to talk about that before we get into all of this uh, really fascinating um, subject matter, I want to um, have you just tell us a little bit about yourself so that our audience is more familiar with you uh, so we can have our, our discussion. You wanna start? Uh, sure. Um, well, Scott and I met as practicing architects and, um, and you get to know someone really well working with someone and um, spend a lot of time dedicated to to our work and so we our relationship grew through our um, our life's mission which is uh, the practice of architecture and uh, in 2003 we married at St. Bernie's uh, I'm sorry St. Peter's, Peter's and, and Bernie, Bernie. Mm -hmm. and um, Scott uh, went through the RCIA program in 2002 um, because we both wanted to have a sacramental marriage. I'm a, uh, a Catholic by birth, and, and Scott is a Catholic by marriage. By convert. By yeah. convert. <laughs> by conversion. And, um, and My daughter also went through, I, I went through the RCIA program there at uh, St. Peter's up in Bernie, and they had a great program, and it was a, it was a tremendous um, experience to go through and learn and I think through that process she gained more insight into her faith as well and yeah, absolutely yeah and my daughter also uh, joined me through that process as well and so we were baptized together fantastic yeah. mm -hmm. well what a, it's great to have both a cradle Catholic and a convert here um, to really give us a sense of the um, the, the connection that yeah. our faith has made between um, beautiful things, the, the, the material world, and what it can really reveal about, um, about our faith and about spiritual realities. So as Catholics then, um, and architects as well, what would you say um, is really, why, why is architecture so important in the Catholic faith? Or, or what kind of impact does it have on our daily practice of, of Catholicism? I would say architecture is um, an expression of our faith and it's inspiring 
and it's um, a place where we have a lot of our, our lives are spent in community and with our families and we experience the sacraments. We're welcomed into the church at baptism through that sacrament and we share in communion with the congregation. Um, we have our paths in life uh, consecrated through holy orders or holy matrimony through the church and all along the arc of our lives we go through that with the church and the witnesses are our parish community. So it also, the church has a lot of symbolism, the physical church, there's a lot of symbolism associated with it that is an extension of our faith. And the, um, the space has been shaped by our liturgy and then the liturgy supports the space. So I think there's a lot of connection between the physical church and um, our faith in the Catholic church. And I think picking up on her comment about the symbolism, it, you know, we, we often forget in our very literate and educated societies that in, in areas around the world even today, but certainly in the history, um, many people's understanding of their faith came through those symbols that were incorporated into architecture, into the components, the, the stained glass windows, the carved screens, the, the, the statuary, and that became a way in which the stories of the Bible became animated and real and meaningful to the faithful when they're they are going through the sacraments that she was describing. Right now, you know, you brought up stained glass and and um, and sculpture and whatnot, and I think most of us uh, lay people who aren't architects kind of mm. think of those things as sort of um, you know you build a building and then afterwards you kind of put all that stuff in. Yeah. Um, but is that all of those type of things, is that something that an architect would, um, would, would think about as they're creating the building? Definitely, and throughout time, those elements were not seen as just a kind of decoration after the thought. They were an integral part of the architecture, and they were also an um, integral part of a uh, reflection of the theology and the liturgy of the time. As, as that has emer emerged and evolved and been through uh, revelation and through tradition has, has, has changed. That is also, as Pam was saying, has, has changed the architecture. So to give you, for instance, talk about the stained glass, that uh, the, the stained glass emerged during the, uh, uh, the, the late uh, 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 Romanesque period and the early Gothic period. And during that period, there was a, a real transformation of theology and there was a, a theology of light that was being uh, de developed by the scholastics. Uh, you think of Thomas Aquinas and these people. Uh, and the uh, theology of light really then sort of became manifest in how, how do those spaces become lighter and airier and kind of give a hint of what the celestial realms might be like to the faithful. Um, and so they would enter into that and in a sense it was getting a glimpse of heaven, a, a glimpse of the promise of, of eternal life through that light that comes through that stained glass that we, we love from that period. Oh, that's awesome. You know, I know that many of our audience members are thinking, this is great. I'm thinking about my church that I go to right now. And so if you do think of any questions, uh, you feel free to please call us and uh, ask us about um, any anything that we discussed tonight or something that you might think of. Call us at 210 734-5371, that's 210-734-5371. And uh, our friend Greg, uh, who is also a co-worker at the Pilgrim Center of Hope, is happy to uh, take your question. Uh, so Scott and Pam, you know, let's talk about how, how long architecture has been a part of our Catholic um, worship experience. You know, we, we really think about um, the, the very early Christians were Jews, mm -hmm. right? And so we do see some of the, um, the Jewish influence mm -hmm. in, in our Catholic churches, and we might, you know, talk about that in a second. But um, take us through a little bit, you know, how, how did we kind of end up where we are today? That's, that's a long story, <laughs> but we'll try to make it as, as concise as possible. You, you mentioned the, you know, the Jewish heritage of, mm -hmm. of the church, and the architecture from the very beginning of Christianity with the followers of, of Jesus and with Jesus himself going into the synagogues. We see, even as a young boy, he was there within the setting of the synagogues, within architecture of his culture and time, and uh, learning the law and debating the law, and uh, many of the important 
uh, scenes that um, are told to us in the uh, in the Gospels take place within very specific places. And you know, it's one of the great things about the Pilgrim Center of Hope. You can go and see some of those places firsthand, and it's a it it really brings those. Uh, those stories and those traditions to life when you can see the physical uh, spaces they take place in. But uh, early Christianity emerged right at a time when there was a huge crisis within Judaism and particularly around 70 AD when um, Titus, uh, who wasn't emperor yet but he was a general at that time, he was the son of the emperor, they uh, laid siege to, to Jerusalem and they destroyed the, the temple. And you go there to this day and see the big stones that they're that the Roman soldiers knocked off the Temple Mount and are mounded up everywhere. And the temple to the Jews, that was the one place in which you could do sacrifice. Mm -hmm. And suddenly the center of their universe and their connection to God had been vandalized and destroyed. And that's where you have the beginnings, the emergence of rabbinical Judaism, where it became then distributed amongst the synagogues and finding a new way of having connection to God. Well, parallel to that, you have the Jewish Christians, the earliest, earliest followers of, of Jesus, and and Paul and his his uh, his uh, his apostles and and disciples, they were also as part of that cultural crisis, mm -hmm. looking for ways of, of new connections to God without having the benefit of the temple. So you had this important architectural center mm -hmm. that was a physical house of God that was that was left vacant. And so suddenly you don't have it, and you have to think of. <coughs> What do we do now? Right. So what do you do now? So that's when th things like the, the house churches become very important. For early Christians, they were met in each other's homes. We see even Jesus, he goes and he invites himself or invites people to join him for a meal in the home. And his disciples followed that as well. And so they would invite people into their home, which is a, you know, uh, even to this day, in the uh, the Near East, the Middle East, you, is is a you know a great tradition and something that's held very sacred. That when you invite someone into your home, that's a very important honor. Mm -hmm. And so that's where the dialogue began. That's where the hearts began to be touched. That's where prayers were shared. Was in just humble domestic dwellings. So as a result, a lot of early Christian, uh, the early Christian period isn't really represented specifically in dedicated architecture. It was in domestic architecture that often a lot of that is now lost to us you know, through the, through the changes and ravages of time. Right, and on a certain point, um, we know that the Christians were persecuted by the Roman Empire, and that's when we get the, um, the catacombs coming into right. play. Um, talk a little bit about that. Yes, so the catacombs uh, were part of a, a burial tradition that was there in in and in around Rome, the uh, the soft volcanic soil allowed you to go in, and uh, the stone allowed you to chisel away. And uh, there was the uh, for several centuries before the 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 Christian era, there was the expansion of these catacombs for uh, Jews, for R Roman uh, uh, classical pagans. They they were burying down there, but for the Christians, it became particularly important during those periods of persecution, and for <clears throat> that period where so little physical evidence exists for us to kind of get insight into the early Christians, their faith and their practice. The catacombs give us a rare glimpse of that. And they were actually carved in, into sort of architectural motifs with, with uh, pediments and columns and things like that that are call, carved out of the living stone. And um, while historians say that perhaps the periods of persecution weren't as extended, but they were very intense at various periods of time, particularly under Nero, and under uh, Diocletian, um, it seems like that the catacombs were used for uh, religious practices, but also burial practices, and they show us, very importantly, um, some of the early iconography of the church. And we have to keep in mind that this is happening within a Hellenistic, Greco-Roman context, where we might have Roman Christians who aren't really culturally connected to the Holy Land and to the Jewish tradition directly. And so what we often see in these, the paintings and the frescoes done in the catacombs is sort of a classical reinterpretation of the Christian stories they were being told by the earlier, early followers of, of, of Jesus who were coming to uh, Rome and other cities within the Roman world and, and telling them the stories of, of the, uh, that we know from the New Testament 
and they were reinterpreting these using classical iconography. So a good example of this is, is like the, the Good Shepherd, where he's got the sheep, the, the, la the lost lamb on his shoulders. Well, that's actually an earlier motif that comes from earlier classical motif of a, of a pastoral god who went out and would gather up the lambs and things like that. But that got translated within the minds and the iconography and the artwork of the, of the uh, Christians of that time period, taking sort of their cultural language and adapting it to their new, newfound faith. So that, that um, this whole concept of really kind of Christians having to adapt, mm. you know, I think I kind of see that theme from the Jews having to adapt Right. with the, the destruction of the temple and then suddenly, you know, oh, well, where are we going to worship? And now we're Christian mm -hmm. and and now we're persecuted, so we have to adapt to that situation. So it, I think it really kind of is, is leading us up to more talking about, um, friends, the, the architecture that we see today. Um, when we come back from this break, we're going to be talking about more of the uh, important churches that you might think of those in Rome, those in uh, the Holy Land, even uh, in Turkey and Greece, um, talking about these wonderful uh, structures that, what do they teach us about our faith? Uh, call us at 210-734-5371 with your questions, and uh, we look forward to learning more from our guests, Pam and Scott Carpenter, uh, here uh, talking about, again, church architecture and what it teaches us about our faith. So again, give us a call, 210-734-5371, uh, and we'll be right back after this short break to learn uh, more, so stay with us. Hi, and welcome back to Catholicism Live. I am Angela Cialana, joining you live from the studios of Catholic Television of San Antonio. And we are also streaming live on the Guadalupe Radio Network. That's 89.7 FM here in San Antonio, KJMA. And uh, of course, we are live on our website, catholicismlive.com. And we're talking about church architecture. And we have two wonderful Catholic architects with us, uh, Pam and Scott Carpenter, who are uh, with Seventh Generation Design here in San Antonio. And uh, they are really kind of enlightening us when we left off on our discussion about how uh, church architecture started to develop. And uh, Scott, you know, I want to get into really what we kind of see today as, um, you know, uh, what we think of as a Catholic church. Sure. So what would be a good example that, that, you would, uh, that you would put forth? Well, I think um, to look at kind of the, the origins of what we see today, uh, a good one would be old St. Peter's. Okay. So if you're going to look at the historical or origins, and before you do that, um, it's good to look at where does old St. Peter's form come from. Right. So we'll, t we'll, we'll step into this, you know, but I'll do it quickly. Um, old St. Peter's form really came from the Roman Basilica, and basilica is a term we hear nowadays that's used particularly for very grand churches, mm -hmm. and it's, it's, a, it's an honorific title now within the church if a particular church, church structure is called a basilica. But originally a basilica was a Roman marketplace. It was sort of the mall of the, of the first, second, and third century Roman period. Interesting. And it also had a uh, law court in it as well. The Romans were very legalistic about everything. And so at the end of the, this large open structure with column, columns going down either side, there would be um, a tribunal, okay. a, a law court of three judges. And before them, there would be a small altar in which a small sacrifice would be given to the judges before uh, the, the contending parties would, would plead their case. Wow, so okay. asking the gods to intervene and have a just outcome. So you already have set up this big, large public building that was for general gathering and uses. When the Christians looked at the models they had around them, we're talking about adapting, mm -hmm. when, when uh, Constantine began, began to uh, patronize them, and with the Edict of Milan, there was the, then the toleration and the legalization of, of Christianity, um, they began to s emerge into the public realm and needed a, f a form of public architecture. But when they looked at the temples, they didn't want it to be associated with pagan temples. And plus, temples were 
uh, within the Hellenistic world were uh, the homes of the gods. The average people didn't go into them. They made sacrifices in the outside and, uh, and altars. So they really needed a place where they could con come together in community because that's what the Christians were about. And so they looked to these basilicas, these marketplaces, and adapted that building form to become now what we call the Basilican Long Plan Church. Okay. So if we look at the old St. Peter's uh, floor plan and um, uh, it's uh, uh, image number 10 we've got here selected, um, you can see that we have all the elements of a Roman basilica, but they've been adapted for Christian use. There's a long, wide space down the middle of the building that's called the nave. That's okay. where most people would stand. And then on either side, there were two side aisles. So that allowed people to circulate around the edges and not have to go through the crowd in the middle. In the front of the church, there was something called the narthex. And the narthex was used by people who were, had not been baptized yet, but they were going through the training process. So they would hear the, um, they could hear the liturgy, but then they had to depart from the, the community and stand in the narthex while communion was being given, because that was only given for, for the members. They were the catechumens. And we use that term even to this day for people who are going yes, through the training say, process. You, is that, are you right. familiar with that? Yes, okay. the catechumens. <laughs> and so the catechumens got to hang out in the narthex. Okay. They were also then trained in what was called an atrium, which is a courtyard, a sort of a square courtyard around uh, in the front of the church. And we often think of those as sort of cloisters nowadays, but that's where the cloisters came from, were the atriums. And in the middle of the atrium was a well where water would be brought up and baptized baptizing would go on right there. Hmm. So the whole process of the sacraments was sort of being played out in the physical form of the architecture. The education that was required uh, took place in that atrium space. Uh, the narthex where you were sort of given entrance into but not you weren't in full communion yet. And then in the nave where you're, you're there in community as, you know, in, enjoying the sacrament of, of Eucharist. Um, now, these, all these words have um, such a meaning as well. You know, we yeah. look at the term nave and that coming from the Latin for ship, you know, and, and the church being, um, you know, even our Pilgrim Center Pope logo yes. mm -hmm. is a ship because of the church being considered the, the people of God, mm -hmm. being considered uh, like this ship that's headed toward heaven um, and what a beautiful you know image for us to really um, contemplate as we enter into our own parish churches to really think about you know all of these different um, parts of the church you know I think we just kind of think okay I walk into my church and I'm in the foyer of the church mm -hmm. and then I go in and that's I think a lot of us kind of think of that main nave of the church as the sanctuary but it actually is mm -hmm. not that's correct, correct. yeah yeah, so sometimes those terms get very confused, and, right. and particularly by our Protestant friends, they, they call maybe sometimes the whole thing the sanctuary or, or the worship center or something like that. But within the Catholic tradition, the sanctuary is that area that's right around the altar, altar. itself and, right. and sometimes extending back into the apse. The apse is that sort of curvy end of the, of the building that often has the high altar in it or has an altar that's dedicated to whoever the patron saint is for that particular church. Um, but yes, you mentioned the, the, the whole idea of the ship. Sometimes you go into some early, um, or even some more recent, uh, you can go into um, St. Austin's up in Austin and they have uh, a sort of a blue-green travertine flooring in there. Mm -hmm. And it was very much picking up on the symbolism of water and that we're in this ship together, you know, as in community. So it was, that's, that's really what, awesome. Yeah. All of the, all of the uh, materials also in, in a church have have a meaning, you know, is, is that maybe perhaps why, um, I, I know some of this must be, uh, you know, due to just practicality in terms of what's available um, to a community, but um, maybe talk a little bit about, you know, what do the, is there, is there a, you know, some kind of symbolism that we might see in the materials that we see inside of our churches? I would 
add that the, the materials for the churches were very noble. While most of the structures in olden time were wood or plaster, very rudimentary, that when the churches were built, they were the finest materials, and they were built over the course of centuries and time and, and took a great deal of talent and craftsmanship. And, and they were very exalting things so that, you know, the deeper you got into the church, the more splendor and there more, the more there was to discover, um, which is part of the beauty of the Catholic churches is that I think each of us finds something new in, in the churches, whether it's in the old world or the new world, we, we always find some new discovery in, in our church architecture um, with every mass or visit. And, and so it's very experiential in that way. And also the, the art and the architecture were really, um, it, it, they were hand in hand where the art became part of the architecture, like the mosaic floors and the stained glass window it was really embedded and they became one, um, one thing. Integrated thing. Integrated yeah. thing. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, Pam raises a really good point that we've got to remember when we look at both ancient churches but also churches to this day as parishes are doing building campaigns is that those churches represent a commitment of that community and that comes with a lot of struggle and strife at some times and, and sacrifice right. and it becomes a, an embodiment of a sacrifice to God that's, that's then there as a part of a living tradition for that, mm -hmm. that particular parish or that particular church community. And, and there's the great continuity that comes about from generation to generation, knowing that that sacrifice was right. done. Yeah. And God, the ultimate builder, um, he sent his son, which was the living stone. He called the living stone. And the foundation of his church was based on the living stone. And also in the Bible, there are many references to building the cornerstone. And, and we, the followers, um, are the living stones. And so it's it's very important for us to carry on that tradition and we I think over the years as earthquakes and wars and fires and um, so many things have happened there's been this constant renewal within the church to rebuild it or to build over the old church and mm -hmm. to enhance it like when you get to the gothic period it's the, the idea was to go higher and, and open up the heavens and um, it's it's a beautiful it's a beautiful thing to Build. Yeah, and I think if you look at the the history of the of the church as well, um, times of reform mm -hmm. happening either spiritually or politically or whatever mm -hmm. often also manifest themselves in time of rebuilding. Mm -hmm. So we think about Saint Francis. You know, we have this cross right here, mm -hmm. and he was he was told to go re rebuild my church, and of course he interpreted that in one way. Literally, and, <laughs> but I think that's I th I think that's not by accident that our faith tradition combines those two words, you know, the mm -hmm. church as the people that make it up, mm -hmm. but also the physical structure right, the and the steps. spiritual mm -hmm. uh, totality of it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, let's look at um, one, of the, one of the churches that I know you both are very enthusiastic about is the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Mm -hmm. And I feel like in the Easter season, we would be remiss if we, if we didn't yeah. at least touch on um, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Yeah. And, um, that you've both been, uh, we've all been privileged to um, to visit, and um, let's let's look at um, maybe you know something that's really interesting um, is that the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, first of all, is enormous. Right. Um, it's the church built over the tomb of our Lord and the mm -hmm. the actual Mount of Calvary, the place where He was crucified. Um, what what was something that struck you? Perhaps you know. I'm sure you you maybe have studied it in the past. You know, but but actually stepping into that church as an architect, what were some of the things that really stood out to you? That really took your breath away, or um, just some memories that you might have. Mm. Can we make this an hour and a half show? <laughs> <laughs> well, let's go to overtime. Yeah. Oh gosh. Um, one is is the sense of community, um, the worldwide sense of community. There, the, everyone shared as, as Christians um, a piece of, of or a section of the church: the Egyptian, Coptic, and the Greek Orthodox, and Armenians, the, the and Armenians, <coughs> the and Latin. Latin Roman Catholic Church, and that's that was what was so beautiful and, and um, inclusive. 
Um, also, they're in a chapel um, off to the side. There were so many places to discover. When I say discover, you probably need a week there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but there was the liturgy of the hours going on in one of the side chapels, which was just glorious and amazing. Um, the splendor, the all-around splendor of every um, apse, niche, uh, icon, um, statue, it was it was pretty stunning. And, and the tomb, I mean. Mm -hmm. uh, and the tomb is, <coughs> there's a building over the tomb within mm -hmm. the, the larger building. It's really, really interesting. It's almost like a, a church within a church in mm -hmm. a way. Right. right, yeah, that's called the rotunda of the Anastasis. So it's the rotunda of the, of the resurrection, basically. Mm -hmm. And so you're right, there's the small tomb that's there that you, we crammed 30 people into it <laughs> and had the most amazing uh, 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 Eucharist uh, experience in there, but then there's this larger rotunda mm -hmm. that's around it. I would add to that the the overall size of the church, but the intimacy. It mm -hmm. felt so intimate at any given space that you were standing within the church. Yeah, for me, you know, I'm not a morning person, <laughs> and I'd get up at 4:30 in the morning. I was so excited about being there and go down through the old uh, old Jerusalem in the quiet streets where the um, you know, the shops hadn't been opened yet, and go and join the early pilgrims going into the church. And I was just so struck by that just sort of immensity and immediacy of history. Mm -hmm. And for me, what was very poignant as I was thinking about how people had fought and died, and you know, there were massive ugly wars and all this kind of stuff that were all fought over control of the Holy Sepulchre. And there we were able to take a 10 hour flight and, and be there and, and, mm -hmm. and have that kind of experience. But what really gripped me is when I went down the large staircase that goes to St. Helena's Chapel. St. Helena was the, the, uh, actually the, the mother of Constantine who commissioned the church. And all along the walls of the steps going down to her chapel, there were incised crosses, hundreds of years of overlaid incised crosses done by pilgrims. And to run your hand across that, and you had that just an instant con con connection to people that had for centuries came to this holy place and shared that faith and that intensity of experience. Right, it's a really, um, it's it's a wonderful place. It's a it's a very uh, sacred place. At looking at the the structure of of the church, what would you say is maybe something that might give it that sense of of intimacy that that maybe you picked up on walking into it? Um, I think it was the the quality of light. Probably um, the immediacy. While the church was grand, there was an immediacy, and, and as Scott had mentioned, the contact with um, the, the the past pilgrims and um, even some of the physical spaces. You mentioned Calvary; mm -hmm. that's in there, and it is all spread out because it's it was over originally a, a stone quarry, and there's the living rock there, and you can go up to Calvary, and it's this those tiny little steep staircases, you remember having to go up those. Mm -hmm. And that really kind of made you humble and you know, cautious as you go up and you, you mount to the top of that and you're there with, in a very small space with your fellow believers and that kind of universal experience where you have people coming from all over the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, the stone of the steps is worn over time and yeah. so many people making that pilgrimage, it's, it's quite, quite right. extraordinary. Well, uh, you know, I want to give um, our, our listeners and our viewers a little uh, announcement or a little, um, I just want to highlight the fact that we are, uh, of course, we, we have our Holy Land pilgrimages going on right now. Um, Deacon Tom and Mary Jane Fox are leading two groups to the Holy Land this month. But uh, we do have two pilgrimages uh, left in the year. We have, uh, first of all, a pilgrimage to see the Shroud of Turin uh, in Italy. And the, the Shroud of Turin is being uh, displayed uh, as a special exhibition in June. So June 7th through 19th, we are traveling to Italy, um, a small group of 20 people. So if you're interested, contact Pilgrim Center of Hope. As well, in the fall, we have uh, October 1st through 14th, the Footsteps of St. Paul pilgrimage uh, where we're going in those footsteps of St. Paul, Turkey and Greece, and we will be traveling to those places where St. Paul preached the gospel to the Gentiles. So um, let us know if you're interested in going with us 
on any of these pilgrimages, pilgrimcenterofhope.org or just go to CatholicismLive.com we'll get you connected. Well, we will be right back and we will wrap up this amazing uh, discussion that we've had about church architecture. Stay with us. Hello and welcome back to Catholicism Live. I'm Angela Cialana and joining me this evening have been Pam and Scott Carpenter, local Catholic architects, and we've been talking about the, uh, the development of Catholic churches throughout the centuries, as well as uh, touching on some things that you might see in your own parish church. And we had a caller who wanted to remain anonymous, maybe was a little shy, but did want to bring up the question of when was it that um, churches took on the cross form that we see today, where we have that main aisle and then we have the transept going mm -hmm. Very through good. the middle. Um, so when when did that take place? You must be a closet architect. You know <laughs> some of those terms. Yeah, transept meaning to cut across, right? And so actually that happened really, really early on. Um, in old St. Peter's, which is was destroyed in order to build new St. Peter's, it was on the same location on the site of the uh, martyrdom of St. Peter's, they had a, a transept there. Um, but if we look at St. Paul outside the wall, which is kind of a funny name because it was outside the city walls, uh, we see uh, a very unusual uh, instance where there are, uh, there's a transept that allowed for pilgrims who were coming to see the burial place of St. Paul. This was a church that was uh, commissioned by Constantine. And th in order to accommodate sort of the swell of pilgrims around the tomb, they created those wings or those, those, those transepts to allow people uh, to get, you know, have more people not just be in the narthex but to crowd around the, to the tomb closer. itself to get it closer. As time went on, as you get into the Romanesque and the Gothic, behind those transepts there would be a series of chapels. Most Catholic uh, churches, particularly in, in France where you've got the most of the Gothic churches concentrated, they would be dedicated to the Virgin Mary, and there would be a Mary chapel that was behind in, a, um, in an area called the choir, okay, or in the apse there. And so that began to pull those arms of the transept kind of closer to the middle and get it into more of a what, kind of what we call the Latin cross shape. So over time to accommodate um, the, uh, the, the various relics that would be brought to the churches and be put in little chapels on the back side in that apse, those transepts began to pull towards the center. But what is always kind of tracked with the transept has been the altar. Mm -hmm. And so that point of crossing is very symbolic to that, the, the notion of, of where you are there taking the Eucharist, that is the body of Christ imposed upon the cross right there in plan of the church. Almost in the heart of the church. In, in the heart of the church. And then most frequently, particularly in the Gothic Romanesque period and going up into the uh, Renaissance, you would have a big tower that would be right above the crossing there. Mm -hmm. So even from the outside, from very far away, you knew where the most important mm -hmm. space was. Or the dome. The, you know, or there would be a dome or tower or spire. It would happen right at that crossing of the transept and the nave. Wow. And that's so, where the altar would be. Yeah. So even, I know um, in my parish, St. Mary Magdalene, uh, <laughs> shout out to everyone there. <laughs> yeah. Um, you do see that higher place in the church is right above the altar, and that's the reason for that is to kind of show the importance or the significance. There's of that hierarchy spot. of space, mm -hmm. exactly. That that the liturgy, the sort of the um, the climax of the liturgy is taking that that Eucharist, and the architecture kind of swells up at that point to capture that point of. Of, of the important part of the liturgy. Mm, that's wonderful. What are some other things that, um, you know, we're, uh, we could go all night long, and I do want to invite our, our listeners and our viewers, if you'd like to, uh, for us to uh, yank the carpenters <laughs> back on Catholicism Live and, and continue this discussion, please let us know um, on CatholicismLive.com. But uh, going back, you know, to our, our parishes this Sunday, um, or even this week, what are some things that we might be looking out for architecturally that might be teaching us some more of these symbols? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Start it off. Well, I'll give one example. We go to St. Peter Prince there in, in Alma Heights, and you walk into the narthex there, and there is a huge baptismal font there. And that's there not just because it happens to be a convenient place to put it, 
but it's symbolic that, that you're coming into the entrance of the church and it's through baptism that you enter into the church as well. So it's, it's strategically located there to remind us of that. And then of course, sacramentals have developed over time where we you know, sort of dab ourselves in the holy, holy water as we go in. But very frequently, you'll come into any Catholic church and you'll see even a very, the very smallest little font there that rem is there to remind you of your baptism vows. Mm, beautiful. And I, I would say um, that something to think about is, is how the DNA of the church and church architecture lives to this day and is expressed in, in our um, churches to this day, like the stained glass windows. You know, we'll see that and you'll see it in an arch or a, a Gothic arch. You'll see it in various forms which reflect back to um, old, older churches. And within that are the stained glass windows and that tell the story of, as Scott mentioned, where before, you know, there were times where people weren't as literate and the, that told the story of the gospel or, um, you know, as a young person today, maybe in church where um, you're in your early years, you can look up at those stained glass windows and that's your first children's liturgy of the word right there mm -hmm. is to look at the pictures and to, to understand um, God's message through those images. And yeah, and they're rich with symbolism, right. just to understand uh, the different iconography of the saints, mm -hmm. to begin to pick out your mm -hmm. favorite saint, you know, by knowing what objects they're generally, you know, they're holding either mm -hmm. in a sculptural form or in stained glass, all those things, those, those objects are not there incidentally. Mm -hmm. You know, for example, like St. Lawrence, he has the, the frying pan because we know the awful way he died, right? St. Peter has the keys, mm -hmm. right? And uh, often it's, uh, you know, if they're a martyred saint, their, their symbol is the way in which they, they, mm -hmm. they died, they, they were martyred. But other saints have other symbols that are associated with them. And as you begin to look at that, that enriches your experience and your, maybe perhaps your connection with your favorite saint to see those symbols, those very tangible symbols, but then to begin to think about what's the deeper meaning under those uh, those symbols. Yeah, and I would say the appreciation for all the patrons and the people that have built those parishes. I think it's a remarkable thing to to come together as a community and put effort, time, and craftsmanship towards something to glorify God. Do you have any particularly favorite churches uh, in San Antonio that we might go visit? And well, appreciate? I love the missions, and yes. uh, as you could imagine, because those really do have that DNA Pam was talking about that goes all the way back into mm -hmm. time. So um, we are so very fortunate to have five of those here. Mm -hmm. And so we can really connect to a very old uh, tradition there. But um, you know, we love St. Mary's downtown. Mm -hmm. It has those Which sustained a yeah. flood and has been rebuilt and, mm -hmm. and has a rich history to it. And yeah, and St. Joseph's and the... And the well, and Saint, uh, yes, and St. Joseph's that stood the test of the development, uh, you know, it's it's hanging on there and it's persevering <laughs> right. in the middle of, of you know, very nine, 26 million um, tourists every year in San Antonio. So it's the remarkable... Perseverance. Yes, there. Yeah. and s survivalist, um, yeah, just timeless, yeah. Awesome. Well, you know, we, like I said, we could have a whole nother program on this mm -hmm. and I'm so grateful that both of you came and lended your expertise and your, uh, your insights. Um, so thank you so much for joining us this evening. We are thank glad to be here with you. Thank you. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. Thank you. And uh, I want to invite, again, our audience, if you would like to learn more uh, from the Carpenters, please let us know. Uh, the only way that we know whether you like a particular topic that we discuss on Catholicism Live is if you tell us. So please um, let us know at catholicismlive.com. And uh, we have uh, next week a wonderful program on the connection between art, uh, the arts, the visual arts, and our faith, uh, hosted by Greg Camacho with uh, Brother Cletus, who is a, a wonderful local Marianist uh, artist, as well as Patsy and Edwin Sasek, who are local artists as well. Um, so look forward to that next week here on Catholicism Live. I know that many of you are uh, wanting to learn more about um, what is my, how can I read all the symbolism in my church? Well, we have a, a wonderful tradition on Catholicism Live where we have a, a pearl of the week and a saint of the week. And the pearl is really a resource that we recommend to you about the topic. So this week's pearl of the week is a book by Father Robert Barron, and it is called Heaven in Stone and Glass. 
And uh, Father Barron is, uh, you may know, a professor of theology at Mundelein Seminary in Chicago. And in this book, he takes us through a guided walk through a typical medieval church. And he tells us how to read the, the things like the light and the darkness and what do gargo gargoyles mean and um, what, are, what are those major lines in the church, the orientation of them, what do those mean? Uh, rose windows and, and things like this. So uh, heaven and stone and glass comes highly recommended. Um, as very readable and also extremely spiritual. So we invite you to check out that book and you can learn more about it on our website, catholicismlive.com. Just click on tonight's episode. Well, uh, we also have our saint of the week and how could we have a saint who didn't uh, have anything to do with architecture? Mm -hmm. we, we definitely have a fitting saint this week. He is Saint Rocco Gonzalez and you may not have heard of him, but he was a Jesuit martyr. Um, he joined the Jesuits in 1609. He was born in uh, Paraguay. Um, and he was actually dispatched to minister to the tribes, the local native tribes uh, in the unexplored wilderness of Paraguay and Brazil. So he taught the native people how to become self-sufficient during this time when the Spanish conquistadors were taking advantage of the native people and he helped uh, St. Rocco helped the uh, natives to learn how to um, develop their architecture, the, excuse me, their agriculture, their, um, their economic development, their political development, so that they could become these little villages. And he actually worked with many Jew Jesuits to uh, establish 30 independent village communities of native tribes. Mm -hmm. And uh, during this uh, development, he, uh, of course, did some city planning. So he was uh, a skilled carpenter, also a, uh, an architect and an engineer. And he actually uh, facilitated the building of many of the community's uh, structures that they needed in these, in these villages. So his story of martyrdom is really um, quite striking. On November 15, 1628, he was celebrating mass on a makeshift altar um, as he continued to minister to the native people. And one of the shamans of the tribe had been uh, enraged by all of the converts that were um, coming to Christianity. And so um, as Father Rocco was celebrating mass, he bowed and one of the conspirators against him struck him with a tomahawk on the head and he was killed in the middle of mass. Uh, two of his fellow Jesuits were also martyred with him, Saints Alonso Rodriguez and Saint uh, Juan del Castillo. So Saint Rocco, we ask uh, that, that this extraordinarily talented saint uh, pray for us to not only uh, help us to see more about what are the, the wonders and the beauty that God has blessed us with in these, uh, these buildings that we worship in, but also to have the uh, enthusiasm that St. Rocco had in spreading the gospel. Well, uh, you know, we, we love to give you, again, resources uh, here on Catholicism Live, so again, visit our website. I want to give you, if you have your catechism, uh, in your hands, because I know you do, because you're good Catholics. <laughs> uh, this section of the catechism deals with architecture and the building of churches. So if you go to the section titled, Where is the Liturgy Celebrated? That's in uh, starting with paragraph 1179. You can learn about not only what the church calls for uh, in, a in a church building, um, and the importance of seeing the beauty in the churches that we worship in, but also it, it breaks down the symbolism of several of the furnishings within our church buildings. So we're talking about the altar, the tabernacle, the ambo, which is the podium uh, where the, the word of God is, is read, the, uh, the, the chair of the presider, why do we call a cathedral a cathedral? You'll learn more about that. So all of these uh, rich uh, things that you can learn about 
are in your catechism that I know you have at home. Uh, again, starting with paragraph 1179, where is the liturgy celebrated? All right, folks. Well, we've come to the end of another Catholicism Live. And again, I want to invite you to join us next week as we talk about our faith and the connection with art. Um, we invite you to learn more about the Pilgrim Center of Hope and the uh, evangelization mission that we have in uh, serving you here in San Antonio and the surrounding area. Um, our mission is to help you to grow in a deeper relationship with Jesus. And that's what our faith is all about, is growing a relationship with Jesus. So as you, uh, as you make your way to CatholicismLive.com, uh, check out tonight's uh, episode notes and also look at the rest of the Pilgrim Center of Hope website. We have so many things going on. We have the Catholic Women's Conference. Uh, registration is opened. We have afternoon teas with the saints, uh, which is a free event where you can learn about the saints. Uh, so many wonderful things. So again, we send that invitation to you. Well, we'd like to close in prayer. So uh, as we do, I'd like to start off with... Uh, a quote from Pope Benedict XVI. So we pray in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Pope Benedict says, may the Lord help us to rediscover the way of beauty as one of the ways, perhaps the most attractive and fascinating, to be able to find and love God. So God our Father, we thank you for this opportunity to learn more about the beauty that you've given us in our Catholic faith. And we ask that you continue to guide us with your Holy Spirit to your Son, Jesus, so that we can grow in not only our understanding, but our love of you and of others. And so we pray all these things with the intercession of our Blessed Mother, all the angels and saints. Thank you, Lord. Amen.